Hello, everyone. Welcome to the May presentation of Evening at Skidaway. Uh, we had some technical issues with our live uh, broadcast on Tuesday evening, so we recorded it. We, we hope you do enjoy tonight's presentation. Our speaker is Dr. Adam Greer. Uh, Dr. Greer is an assistant professor of biological oceanography and zooplankton ecology. He received his bachelor's degree from Vanderbilt University and his doctorate from the University of Miami. He joined our faculty in 2019 from a position at the University of Southern Mississippi. Dr. Greer, take it away. Thanks, Mike, for the introduction and thanks everyone for watching on YouTube. Uh, this content for this talk is really a summary of kind of things I've been researching and thinking about for about 10 years since I started working with plankton imaging systems like the one you see in the center here. Um, this is a camera system that we tow behind a ship and it takes pictures of plankton that you see across your screen. And so throughout the talk, I've kind of peppered the talk with um, these black and white images of ocean critters. And hopefully throughout the talk, we'll learn about how the system works. And hopefully I'll be able to demonstrate to you that the data from these kinds of systems are tremendously valuable for understanding the ocean environment that these organisms experience. So if any of you have put on a mask and snorkel or maybe even been scuba diving, you probably were immediately drawn to all the different types of fish that were in the ocean with various colors and life forms. And if you're really lucky, you may have seen a shark or something like a marine mammal like this manatee. And so all these animals are very different as far as their behaviors and the way they look. But the thing they have in common is that they're all able to basically swim wherever they want to go. And scientists use this term necton to refer to any animal that can control its movement. Basically, there is no ocean current that is too strong um, to keep these animals from deciding where they want to go. But when we think about all the different things that live in the ocean, the necton are actually very uncommon. So this uh, graph here is showing abundance on the y-axis and linear dimension or size on the x-axis. And what you'll notice is that the necton are really um, actually not that abundant, even though they're very large size. And most of these other organisms are plankton meaning that they cannot control where they move. And this includes things like viruses and bacteria, um, phytoplankton, zooplankton. But today I'm gonna to be talking all about things that are actually in this size category. And so from about one millimeter to a few centimeters in size. And I wanna stress that everything I'm talking about in this talk is not microscopic. These are all things that you can see with naked eye they just range in size from things about the size of a grain of rice to something like a jellyfish, which you may be familiar with, that are the size of about a dinner plate. And notice that some of these fish are actually smaller than some of these larger plankton, but the key is that the fish can swim very well, whereas things like jellies cannot swim that well. And so just to delve a little deeper into what are these plankton organisms. The word plankton comes from this Greek word planktos, meaning wanderer or drifter, which kind of gives you an idea of how these organisms live. They can't swim against the prevailing currents in the ocean. On the one hand, we have phytoplankton, uh, which are essentially responsible for about half the oxygen that we breathe in the atmosphere. Uh, these are essentially similar to um, plants, but suspended in the ocean. So they're fixing carbon and generating all these compounds that are useful for life and the waste product that they emit is oxygen. And on the other hand, we have the animal component of the plankton known as the zooplankton. And um, in the phytoplankton, we have essentially a bunch of different types, but one that I'm gonna talk about a lot today are diatoms, which form these long chains or they can. Um, and with the imaging system, they kind of look like this, like little strands or fibers. Um, but with other imaging systems, you can actually see the cells of these chains and other types actually have, you know, um, cells by themselves. So they don't always form these long chains. The zooplankton or the animals are divided into two main groups. One is the holoplankton, which spend their entire lives as drifting 
part of the plankton community. This includes copepods, appendicularians, as well as gelatinous organisms. And a lot of these are actually feeding on the phytoplankton. But there are other holoplankton that consume things like copepods and appendicularians. And this includes a lot of gelatinous organisms like siphonophores, tenophores, uh, various jellies, and worms like the heated gnath, which is an arrowworm, and a polychaete worm shown here. And the other component of the zooplankton are the meroplankton, which are larval animals. So these are things that spend a brief period of time in their life cycle as part of the plankton. And then eventually they get to be large enough where they can become nekton. Um, and this includes things like, this is a larval flatfish. This is a pipefish. Um, you can see the little snout here and the tail up here. This is a larval lobster. And these are two different stages of larval crabs. And this is a tube anemone. So all of these um, meroplankton will eventually grow out of the planktonic phase and uh, carry out their juvenile and adult lifestyle. So the, when you think about all these different animals in the ocean, they really face these remarkable odds against survival. And every bony fish that we know, almost every bony fish that we know of starts as an egg that's about a millimeter in size. And every female um, releases essentially tens, to, tens of thousands to over a million eggs into the water column. They hatch into little tiny larvae. Uh, many of them are actually consumed by predators almost immediately. And then once they're hatched in the larvae, about 99% of them will die every day, mostly through being eaten by other animals, and then also some through starvation because they just don't have enough food in their little habitat. And the few lucky ones actually make it to the adult phase. And all of this I'm showing you here are the life stages of a swordfish. And so this tiny thing that can fit on your finger actually becomes something that is the size of several people once it reaches the adult phase but it's just remarkable odds that they have to go through to make it um, to the adult phase. And so this is actually a pattern that is common throughout all of these ocean animals, or at least a lot of ones that we care about. Uh, notable exceptions are sharks and marine mammals that give birth to or lay large eggs of very well-developed young, but most things can fit on your finger. And then if they're lucky and they make it through to the juvenile phase, they can fit in the palm of your hand and then eventually they make it to the adult phase. And so this is actually the larval trajectory of a blue marlin. So it looks kind of like a swordfish, but it's actually a different family. And they have different looking larvae and juveniles as well. And there are other types of larval forms that are really neat looking. This is a, a leptocephalus larva, which is the larval form of most eels. And also tarpon and bonefish have a similar leptocephalus larval stage. And then another type of larval form that we see is the phylosoma, which is the larval stage of lobsters. And they're kind of leaf-like, really flattened. And they also consume jellies, as you can see from this little gif I've shown here. So this tiny organism becomes a slipper lobster, but um, you know, main lobster, spiny lobsters, all of these have similar um, early stages that look kind of like this one I'm showing here. And so in my lab group, we're really interested in understanding the ecology of these zooplankton, these animals that are in the water column. And uh, the word ecology um, comes from this Greek word oikos, meaning household. And so what we're really interested in is the physical environment. So like, just like your house has walls and a door, we're interested in the physical environment of the ocean, and then also the things in the environment and how they interact. So how you would interact in your household with your family members, your pets. Um, we're interested in the interactions between uh, biolo biological organisms as well. And so ecology is studied in the land, or sorry, ecology is studied on land or in the sea. And it's actually a much more advanced science on land, mostly because it's really easy to see what's happening on land. And this is a figure that's from a pretty famous paper um, from a long time ago by MacArthur, 1958. And what he did was really meticulously observe the um, behaviors and where these different birds aggregated on a tree. And so this different species, the green indicates that they spent a lot of time in those parts of the tree. And this is a really important finding at the time because it was showing that all these different species have these little micro habitats on the tree. And this allows them to kind of avoid competition amongst each other. So how do we, 
so MacArthur was able to just look at the tree and make a bunch of inferences and conclusions about what was happening with these birds. But in the plankton world, we have to sample in a much different way. We actually typically use net systems that we tow through the water. Sometimes there are dolphins that swim in front of the net. But after this net is in the water for a certain amount of time, we pull up the sample that's at the base of the net. And from this kind of sample, uh, we have to go through it and we look at it under a microscope and we identify all the different things in the sample. And from that, we can get an average abundance and the percent composition. So what percent of each plankton type was present in that sample? And so if you think about MacArthur's warblers, what would happen if we sampled the warblers like we do plankton? We would take a big net and we would just drag it through the tree and then eventually it would pull up a bunch of different warbler species. And in this case, in a hypothetical example, I would think that this net going down the center would catch a bunch of these bay-breasted warblers and maybe the myrtle warbler, a lot of those probably too, but it might miss a bunch that aggregate on the edges. And so the additional benefit when you pull a net through a tree or something like that is that you could actually see which birds are avoiding the net and maybe some get through the net that we can't see or that you'd actually be able to detect. But with sampling plankton, we really have no such luxury. We can't see what we're missing because the net is in the water, it's sampling, but we don't know if it's missing certain things or how organisms are able to avoid the net or aggregate in certain areas. And I really like this quote by a pretty famous oceanographer, Richard Harbison. And he said that sampling ocean plankton with nets is like flying over London with a grappling hook. You would probably pick up a few hats, umbrellas, and tree branches, but you would have to speculate about where hats belong or what umbrellas are used for. And his point is that when you get this sample, it's really not representing what the actual environment is. And I don't wanna act like I'm completely uh, dismissing the value of these net systems, because there's actually a lot of value in um, the measurements that we can get from a sample like this. But my key point is that we're missing something about the ecology of these organisms when we average across a net toe. And so people have realized this for quite some time. And there were two major events that happened that led to the proliferation of a bunch of different imaging systems. Um, namely, the fact that computer power got much better and digital cameras also became uh, widespread. And so in the mid 90s to early 2000s, there were a lot of different imaging systems that were developed. Um, you can see a few examples down at the bottom of the screen. Um, all they all have in common is that they're measuring the abundances of plankton with really high resolution, and they have really precise oceanographic data that goes along with all those images. And that we can also um, use semi or fully automated data processing because it's all digitized. And these camera systems sample fragile organisms really well. And uh, most of them are towed behind a large oceanographic research vessel. The system that I've been using a lot for my research over the years is the in situ ichthyoplankton imaging system. So ichthyoplankton is a fancy word for fish larva. And um, basically that's the original design of this system was to sample fish larvae because uh, what it, advantage it has over other systems is that it can sample a really large volume. And the way that works is you have basically these two torpedo-like things at the bottom, which hold the imaging components. And this is an overhead shot of those two pods at the bottom. And so in one pod, you have an LED or a light source that goes through a pinhole and it gets projected across this image water parcel by hitting a mirror and then another mirror. And then that mirror that hits another lens, which refocuses it into the camera. And so anything in this image water parcel blocks that light source and it's picked up by the camera as a shadow. And we call this shadow graph imaging. And the big advantage of this lighting technique is that anything in this uh, imaged water parcel will remain in focus. And so you can get a really large volume of water in each image. The vehicle that this um, imaging component is housed on also has these wings that allow the vehicle to kind of dive up and down through the water column. Um, and then as it's diving up and down, it's on a tether, so it's on a, on a piece of cable that's shooting all this data up onto the ship 
Um, and uh, we get about two terabytes of image data every three and a half hours. So just tons and tons of images coming up through this uh, cable onto the ship. And one of the real advantages in addition to this large volume is that really transparent and difficult to see organisms really pop when you image with backlighting, like with shadow graph imaging. And so this is a leptocephalus larva that we caught on a recent cruise in the South Atlantic Bight. And this is the exact same individual in shadow graph vision. And so you can really see that you can barely make out this leptocephalus larva that spans the entire um, width of this, uh, this container that we're holding. And it really nice contrast. You can see it really well in the shadow graph. And one of the fun things about this system is that you kind of feel like you're at NASA mission control when it's in the water because all this data is flooding into your uh, computer system. You have basically a monitor with two different live feeds of the camera. So you can actually see what's in the water at a given time. You know the approximate depth of the vehicle and if it's pitching or rolling. And you can also monitor all the physical data that's being collected. So the temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen, things like that. And so it's actually a really fun um, thing to deploy and watch um, when everything's working right. And so one of the big findings from all the research I've done with this system is really in several different marine environments, we see that the environment is highly structured. And what I mean by that, I, I'll demonstrate with this video. This is one profile through this feature, which is a thin layer of high chlorophyll fluorescence. So this is depth on the y-axis and the x-axis has chlorophyll A, which is a proxy for phytoplankton abundance. And so you'll notice in the images that when we get inside this layer, we'll see a lot of these diatoms, which are phytoplankton. Not surprisingly, there's a ton of diatoms where there's a lot of fluorescence. But also keep in mind that there'll be a bunch of these doliolids, which are gelatinous organisms. They kind of look like barrels. And you'll also see um, some of these kind of rod-shaped zooplankton, which are ketogenes or arrowworms. And so as I play the video, this green dot will move and the green dot will show you exactly where each image is being taken. And so as we move kind of closer to the thin layer of phytoplankton, you'll start to see that there's not that many diatoms. Uh, there's a few of these doliolids every now and then. Um, but once this uh, system gets to be pretty close to this layer, uh, you'll start to see there's a lot more diatoms very suddenly. And you see a real explosion in the numbers of doliolids as well, which are aggregating right in that layer. And then before you know it, you're out of the layer and the numbers of diatoms start dwindling and you start to see a lot of doliolids still, um, but the diatoms to me look a little different where they're a lot shorter and they just have a different look to them, not quite as thick as they were in the layer. And so as you can see from this demonstration, that there's a lot of variability in what these organisms experience just traveling a few meters in the water column. And this is the northern Gulf of Mexico, but I can say there's similar results um, that we have from different environments. And really, when you deploy these imaging systems, you see the ocean in a new way um, and you see new things every time. So if you're a larval animal, one of these fish larvae, this is your home. You're out in the middle of the ocean. Um, and it's not, you know, this to me looks like you could swim out into all this area, but Really, since you're plankton, your home is really just a cube of water. And that cube of water is being pushed around by the currents and you can move within the cube, but you're more or less confined to a certain um, space. And the benefits of being in this cube is that you have food, presumably there's a lot of light so you can see the food. And vision is the dominant sensory mode that fish larvae use to find their prey. And also the dominant sensory mode of the predators of fish larvae, which are namely larger fishes. Um, the problems you have, of course, is that everything in this cube of water is bigger than you. Everything that is bigger than you is faster and wants to eat you. And you really have no place to hide because you're in a cube of water. It's very easy to see what's in the cube. So how do you survive? You could maybe find something bigger than you that's not interested in eating you. Um, we see this sometimes. You can potentially hide from sight by having transparent parts of your body. There's also the option of direct defenses like spines, or you could mimic something that maybe isn't quite as desirable. And that's a combination of traits 
that you have and behaviors. And so throughout the rest of the talk, I wanna highlight that these imaging systems are providing new evidence of all these different survival strategies I just mentioned. Um, and we're really seeing kind of for the first time, you know, what the organisms experience within that little cube and how they may react um, given different uh, factors in their environment. So on the first um, point, the behaviors that we see, we're actually seeing a lot of new behaviors with uh, these imaging, this imaging systems. Um, one thing that we see is that this is a large, relatively large medusa or, or jellyfish known as Pelagia noctiluca. It's actually a very um, toxic uh, jelly that shows up in the Mediterranean a lot, but we actually saw it in pretty high numbers in the Gulf of Mexico. And one interesting thing is that um, a lot of these fish will aggregate around a lot of these jellies. Sometimes you see a lot of fish around them, but other times you don't. And so what we did was tow this imaging system during the day and during the nighttime. Um, and we looked at, are there fish associating with these uh, jellies during the day and night? And one thing about the Gulf of Mexico is that near the surface, it's very high in dissolved oxygen. As you go deeper in the summertime Gulf of Mexico, it's very low. And so what this is showing you is that uh, the position of all these jellies, and if they had fish associated with them, there's a large size dot. And if there are no fish, then it's a very tiny dot. And so um, in the daytime, we see a lot of these jellies that are up in the water column. They have fish associated with them. There are also some that don't have fish, but during the nighttime, there are actually no jellies that had fish associated with them. All of them were a little bit deeper in the water column and they had no fish. Um, so it's interesting there that there's some sort of effect of day and versus night on the behavior of these fish and whether or not they aggregate around these jellies. And we don't really know exactly what's happening, but it's really the first time we can kind of describe this type of pattern uh, in detail. So now I'm gonna move on and talk about the traits that um, larvae have that may increase their chances of survival in the plankton. And so when we think broadly about the traits animals have, some animals look a certain way and it's very obvious that they have traits that are maximizing their ability to survive. And in one example that I think is really obvious is just the, the attribute or the trait of high speed. So the ability to move really fast. On land, a uh, cheetah is the fastest land animal. They basically have really long legs, a kind of barrel chest for attaching all those really strong muscles, a relatively small head, because a large head would kind of weigh it down. So they're light, they're lanky, and they can run like the wind. And dog breeders actually converged on a similar body shape where they bred the fastest dog. And it kind of looks like a cheetah as far as its body shape. It has a small head, long limbs, a big chest that can really support powerful muscles. In the ocean, it's pretty similar in that um, bluefin tuna are kind of football shaped, very streamlined. It's very obvious and intuitive to us what a fast fish looks like. And mako sharks are the fastest shark species and they have a similar kind of uh, tail that the tuna have and a similar sort of shape of their body where they're very streamlined. And so this body plan generates maximum speed. But not everything can be the fastest in a given environment. So there's many strategies for survival. And this best strategy often depends upon the environment and the other organisms around you. And so the context is really key. And so I'd argue that we need this kind of evolutionary perspective to really understand ocean plankton and why they look the way they look. And we have to keep in mind that every animal alive today is descended from a continuous line of successfully reproducing ancestors. And what I mean by that is that all different species of animal are kind of optimized to survive all their different life stages. And so, you know, natural selection over time has, has generated animals that are really well equipped to survive at every different life stage. And so each life stage has its own kind of look to it that's adapted to survive that one. And so another quote I kind of want you to keep in mind as we go through the next few slides is that it will profit the individual not to have its nutriment wasted upon building in building up a useless structure. And this is a quote from Charles Darwin in The Origin of Species. And what he means by this is that there's an economy of nature that all body structures 
um, on any animal have cost to maintain them. And so the body structures have to benefit their survival or reproduction in some way. And one example of kind of something that appears to be a useless structure on first glance is the peacock's tail. So the peacock has this really elaborate tail, it actually weighs the bird down, prevents it from flying well, and it can't run fast because it has this huge tail. And so it appears to be a, a useless structure. But when you know something about the biology of the peacock, you know that this tail is very important in mating. And so the, the, the traits for the, the tail have been passed down because the peahens prefer the peacocks that have this large elaborate tail. And so you often see these really elaborate structures in kind of these odd mating kinds of systems, a lot of times in birds. But with fish larvae, if you see something like this, it doesn't really make much sense because they're not mating by definition. They're larvae, they're sec not sexually mature. And so um, you have to kind of keep in mind when you see elaborate structures, what their purpose is in survival or reproduction. And so one of the traits that we see that's really common in the zooplankton are um, some traits that have evolved independently many different times. And two examples are transparency. So there are many different types of transparent organisms. And then there's also a bunch of different organisms that are very spiny. And this includes early life stages of crabs. And these are stomatopods that are also quite spiny looking. And the downsides for both of these um, traits is that, first of all, with transparency, not everything can be transparent. The retina has to absorb light. So if you have eyes, it, they can't be transparent. If the guts are full of food, they can't be transparent. Some bones and other parts also cannot. And so a lot of these larvae that are more transparent still have parts of the body that are not uh, transparent near the head and gut area mostly. On the other side, uh, the downsides of spination is that spines are really heavy. And so if the spines are really long, um, there's just a lot of energy that's required to, to keep uh, your, yourself up in sunlit waters if you're being weighted down by large spines. And if you have an exoskeleton, like a lot of these crustacean larvae, it actually isn't that costly to just kind of extend out um, uh, parts of your exoskeleton to make spines. But for larvae, they're still gonna have this, the fish larvae are gonna still um, be weighted down by this uh, spination. And there's still a few families that do have spines, but not quite as many as there are that are transparent. And so this is one particular family that's notoriously spiny. This, these are uh, scorpanids, uh, the stonefish, and also lionfish are part of this family. And so their larvae have a lot of these spines all over them. But survival in the plankton is really the result of how the organism looks, but also how it behaves. And the transparency may not be just about hiding, as we'll see. And so to kind of reiterate, you know, larval survival is key for population sustainability of all fishes. So these larvae must have traits that maximize the probability of survival. Like I said before, there these organisms are, are adapted to or optimized to survive all their life stages um, throughout. And two ways to do this are to minimize starvation, which the larvae can't really do because they can't control what's in their cube of water where they respond. But they can possess traits that possibly could reduce predation. And it's widely known that fast growth for these fish will limit the predation just because they reach a larger size and then there are fewer predators once you reach a large size. But in the short term, when there's an encounter between the fish larva and a predator, what are the options that can maximize survival? We've seen that um, some fish will hide and that they will actually move towards floating objects like jellies, or they're also evolved into transparency. Uh, they could flee also, or they could defend using these spines that we saw in the last slide. And so given this economy of nature that no nutriment will be wasted on developing a useless structure. Do these larvae make sense? So here is a, um, this is the larval form of a scalloped ribbon fish shown here. And I've kind of labeled parts of the body that I think have a clear benefit and others that have a questionable, ben questionable benefit. So the eye has a clear benefit in that it allows them to find food, it allows them to see predators, the tail allows them to move around in their little cube of water. But some of these other parts of the body 
they don't really seem to make much sense. This is a large dorsal fin ray. It's very flexible. It has these little pigmented swellings on it. And it has a similar kind of structure on the bottom of its body. And the juvenile is even more elaborate where it has these even longer fin rays with more pigments and more rays overall and a lot of these interesting pigmented patterns on it. This is a larval flatfish and we see with a lot of flatfish that they have um, long dorsal fin rays that are also flexible and pigmented. This one actually has little fleshy appendages on it. And um, one of the cool things about um, flatfish is they actually have one of this most amazing life history transitions where when they're larvae, they're actually, um, they just have eyes on each side. And at a certain point in development, one of the eyes actually migrates through the skull to the other side. And then they carry out their adult phase on their, basically on their side, but with two eyes um, on the, on one side of the body. And so, uh, you know, they look like this as adults. And this is basically showing that transition um, where the eye is migrating through the skull and then it's becoming a juvenile. And so this is, this is a picture I took of a flounder that you can barely see. And so a lot of times they'll have really good camouflage on that one side where their eye migrates to um, and they carry out their juvenile and adult phases, um, basically trying to be as cryptic as possible on the bottom of the ocean. And this is an example of a bunch of different larvae from the same family of fishes known as mictopids or lantern fishes. These are actually some of the most abundant vertebrates in the entire world. This is a midwater fish, and so it has a huge habitat all over the world. But the adults actually have this kind of standard look to them. They don't really look much like the larvae at all. And there are really a lot of questionable uh, features on these larvae that don't appear to have a real benefit. Namely, these are eyes that are on the ends of stalks. This is a trailing gut that has a little pigment at the end of it. This larva has this really long uh, extension of the dorsal fin that covers basically the entire body and the same on the bottom part, as well as a gut that hangs out and is pigmented as well. And so really bizarre larval forms, especially considering how the adults are pretty streamlined and adapted to a more nectonic lifestyle. So what's happening in the plankton that makes for these larval forms to exist? And so if we go back to our short-term survival options, um, you know, hiding, these features aren't helping them hide. In many cases, they're actually making them more conspicuous, easier to see for the predator. They're definitely not helping them flee because they actually increase the drag. If this larva were to swim, it would be kind of hindered by the fact that it has these long um, fleshy appendages on the dorsal and ventral side of the body. And they're also don't appear to be helping them defend. They're not really spiny, they're very flexible. And so that led us to think that these features on these larvae might actually be helping them mimic um, less palatable organisms in the water possibly. And so um, there's this this really well-known uh, phenomenon in nature known as Batesian mimicry. And one of the best examples is when, um, so essentially it means that there's something in nature that's very toxic, tox toxic or noxious that predators see and avoid. Um, and then some things that are not toxic will actually evolve to look similar to that because they receive protection by resembling something that's very toxic. And so this example, a coral snake is a venomous snake and um, a lot of birds and things that hunt snakes will avoid this one. And so the scarlet king snake has evolved over time to kind of look like it. And it's not perfect, so they don't look exactly alike, but all it takes to escape a predator is really just a one second snap judgment where the predator may think that you're something dangerous and that you can get away. And so really this scarlet king snake is a sheep in wolf's clothing. It looks really tough, but it's actually harmless to uh, most predators that eat snakes. And ocean examples of mimicry are really rare. There's a few examples on coral reefs that are pretty widely known, but we were able to publish a paper that kind of looked at all the data that we're getting from these imaging systems to build this case that we actually think that mimicry is happening on a pretty large scale in the planktonic world. And throughout this, the rest of this talk, um, I'm going to use this color coding scheme. So the red dots indicate models, which are things that are toxic or not palatable. 
and the mimics are going to have a black dot next to them. And so in this case, all these fish larvae will have black dots because they're mimicking the less palatable models. And in nature, most mimicry examples have these three main characteristics. First of all, the model organism, which is the toxic one, is undesirable to a visual predator because it's noxious or it's just not nutritious. Um, the second characteristic is that the model is usually much more abundant than the mimic. And the third is that the mimic resembles the model through appearance and behavior. And I'm going to go through step by step of these three characteristics to hopefully demonstrate to you that all these things are being met by the environment that these larval fish experience. And so first of all, there has to be a lot of undesirable models. And so one of the main characteristics that we've seen, well, that people have seen with studying gelatinous organisms is that many fish do not like to eat gelatinous zooplankton or jellies. And this is a study from 2002 where they offered this blue-headed wrasse a controlled diet and then fresh tissue from a bunch of different um, gelatinous organisms. And so these hatched bars are the gelatinous tissue. And what you can see is that with the gelatinous organisms, they're much less preferred compared to the control in almost all instances, only until you get to like some of these slightly, um, you know, less gelatinous things, a little more robust, more robust, probably, um, you know, have some more nutritional value. Do you see them uh, not have a difference between the control? And one of the kind of crude ways that in plankton ecology that we can assess whether something is nutritionally valuable or not is through looking at its carbon content per unit wet mass. And so the X axis here is just showing the carbon content. So higher numbers on the right indicate more carbon content per unit body mass. And this is obviously less um, over here with less carbon content. And this is just a histogram. And so what you see in the whole planktonic world is there are basically two peaks of carbon content. One peak over on the crustacean side where we see a lot of these um, crustacean and spiny larvae and shrimps and things like that. And then on the other side, we have a lot of gelatinous organisms that are low in carbon content. And so I call this in the cheeseburger uh, part of the spectrum. So these are very valuable uh, organisms as far as nutrition, have a lot of calories per unit. And these are where the fish are. So fish have a lot of value if they're consumed by a predator, uh, nutritional value. And then on the other side, in the jelly world, we have, we're more like the uh, head of iceberg lettuce into the spectrum. And so these are not that nutritionally valuable. Um, you have to eat a lot of them to get the same gain that you would get from one of these um, crustaceans or fish larvae. And another pattern that we see in many different environments is that jellies that are about the same size as larval fish are much, much more abundant than fish larvae. And that's consistent across many different environments, the Gulf of Mexico, off the coast of Massachusetts, um, in different habitats in that region, at the shelf edge as well. So right where the continental shelf drops off, we see a lot of salps and not many fish larvae. And there's just a really striking resemblance and something that, you know, colleagues and I had, had talked about since about, you know, the year 2010 about how you know, there's a lot of fish larvae that have really strong resemblances to various gelatinous organisms. This is a leptocephalus larva, so that's the eel larva that we saw earlier. And this is a tenophore that looks almost exactly like it. All of these are different. This is two siphonophores and a tenophore, and these are different fish larvae with these long um, appendages. These are dorsal fin rays usually that are pigmented, kind of like we saw earlier, and these really long extensions that kind of make them look like jellies. And there's some behaviors that we see too that actually enhance the ability of some of these fish to mimic uh, gelatinous organisms. And so these are flatfish larvae and this is a salp and they're just in kind of their normal posture. But a lot of times we see flatfish larvae actually curl up into a little ball with two of their um, dorsal fin rays poking out. And with this posture, they look really similar to this very abundant um, hydromedusa known as the goblet medusa. And it's shaped kind of like a goblet, which is where it gets its name. Um, but these are really abundant and they're probably not that nutritionally valuable. And the fish look like them. And it's not perfect memory, mimicry, remember. Uh, it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to deter the predators slightly um, so that they can get away potentially. And so now you're gonna take 
turn as being the predator. And so there are two larval fish in this image. You have to find them really, really quickly. Too late. They're right here, and there's another one down here. And all the rest of these are the models. These are uh, doliolids, which are gelatinous organisms that are not very palatable. And so it's a really difficult choice that the predator has to make, where they have to make these snap decisions about what to attack and what to avoid. And even images, I think, are a little misleading because in reality, all these different organisms, organisms are going to be moving around in this um, frame. And so it's really not that easy to just kind of stare at the fish and be like, OK, that is definitely a fish. Um, that's not the way it's going to work when a predator is actually hunting. And so my take home messages from all this is really that these camera systems are improving our perception of the zooplankton realm and basically allowing us to have a more representative sample of what's there. And once we have this frame of reference, all these evolutionary forces that drive these really bizarre larval fish traits start to make a bit more sense once we understand the context that these larvae are experiencing. And I really believe that a lot of this stuff I've talked about is just scrape, scraping the surface of what can be discovered. And that leads me into the final part of the talk where I get into how you could help with some of these discoveries um, with imaging systems. And one of the great benefits of working with a camera system, an imaging system, is that uh, the data, instead of being confined to a lab, are actually digitized and it can easily be shared with other people. And so there are many groups out there that are using um, citizen science to help with analysis of these large data sets. And one of those that I helped um, start was planktonportal.org. And there's a, there, there are some data sets up there from the California Current that you can interact with today. And so you just have to sign up on this uh, Zooniverse website, you make an account, and then before you know it, you can start identifying plankton on your own. And these go into a database and they help with a lot of the machine learning stuff because we need uh, people to actually verify what's in these images in most cases. Another really cool sport that you can get involved with if you're interested in these critters is blackwater diving, which is essentially going out into the middle of the ocean in the middle of the night and jumping into the water and with your flashlight, just looking around at what's around you. And it's really like, um, almost like being in outer space, at least what I would imagine it being. I've never actually done it, but it looks really exciting. And they see the most amazing larval fish you've ever seen. and um, this was actually picked up by the New York Times recently, where they talked about all the fish that they see and how beautiful they are, and then also the scientific value. So a lot of these fish have never been captured because they're a little too fast uh, to get in the net systems. And they, even if they are captured, this is a comparison between a ethanol, so this is a fish, the same fish that was preserved in um, alcohol or ethanol. You can see that a lot of the colors and the, the little details are lost once you dunk one of these fish in a preservative like ethanol. And the same thing here where all these little pigmentation spots that you see on the live fish, they basically go away because the, the ethanol has you know this, this property where it kind of degrades a lot of the tissue and therefore you lose a lot of the information um, that you might get. And the big bonus over our toad imaging system is that you get color photographs, which are incredibly valuable. And just not many of these organisms have been photographed ever or, or documented by science in some cases. So uh, just to conclude, you know, I just want to encourage everyone next time you're in the water and you put on your mask and snorkel, try to focus a little bit closer to your mask because there's this whole amazing world of these plankton that are not microscopic. They're things that you can see right in front of your face. In many cases, you're looking right through them at the fish or the dolphin or the shark. And so I just want to reiterate that these imaging systems are really generating a ton of value just from these detailed observations and providing a glimpse into how these organisms respond to their environment and leading to new discoveries that I've gone over. And there's really a lot of power in numbers, not in terms, just in terms of the data, the amount of data that these imaging systems produce, but also in the amount of participation we can get from outside of the scientific community. There's just a lot of opportunities to get involved and try to understand these organisms using the data generated from imaging systems. And with that, I just want to thank my lab group, uh, Laura Tribal, 
Kyle Aaron, Patrick Duffy, and Severin Brown, who've all been really helpful in getting my group um, up lab up and running and research up and going. Um, many funding agencies over the years and postdoc and graduate mentors um, have made all this research possible. And not surprisingly, when you deploy very large thousand pound expensive instruments in the ocean, you need a team of people to help you. And so there's been many people over the years that have helped with field work, image analysis, all sorts of things. Um, and so I just wanna thank all those people who are some of which are listed here. And um, of course the captains and crews of all these different ships who have helped us with all the logistics of deploying these instruments um, also deserve a great deal of credit because it wouldn't be possible without them. And with that, I'll take questions. You can email me, visit the website. <laughs> so thank you. Outstanding, Dr. Greer. Thank you very much. And uh, if you are interested in questions, take a look. There is Dr. Greer's uh, email, atgreer at uga.edu. He's a good guy and he'd be happy to answer any questions. And thank you for watching this recording of our evening at Skidaway program. Hey, Mike. We also, um, we, I, had, I did take a few questions from uh, the faculty who were here. Um, if we wanted to ask those, it's up to, up to you guys now. Oh, that would be fine. I didn't know there were, that, 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 that would be okay. Yeah, we solicited them from the practice talk and uh, from those who were here. So I don't know if that's all right. Um, yeah, fire okay. away. A couple of the questions are about the instrument itself, and you mentioned at the end there, I think you actually answered one of them, which was um, how heavy it is. Is it a thousand pounds? Uh, so I mentioned at the very beginning that I've worked with different versions of this instrument. And so the one we deployed in the Gulf of Mexico, so a lot of these images, actually all the images you see on this screen are from the Gulf of Mexico. And that instrument is a thousand pounds. It's about the size of a smart car which maybe you're familiar with, but yeah, you know, it's got a three foot by four foot footprint basically. And it's on a steel cable. So, you know, it's a really, it's able to hold much more than a thousand pounds. And so uh, it can get a little uh, hairy when it's um, rocking out there, when you got this thousand pound instrument suspended over the water, but uh, you know, it's exciting too. <laughs> Great. Actually, that brings about begs a, a related question I have here, which is um, how, what is the cost of that instrument if you were to buy one new? Or do you guys uh, the have big one that's the thousand pound one? I think it costs this. And the, keep in mind, this is the instrument. This is all the sensors. And it's also a fiber optic winch, which is a very specialized um, cable that has three fiber optic wires running through it. There's just not many that are out there. So that winch with the instrument and all the sensors, that's a thousand pounds. That thing I think costs about four hundred thousand dollars. Oh, okay. Oh, well, that's interesting context. <laughs> or about the price of uh, about four days on an ocean class research vessel. So <laughs> yeah, there you go. Great. Um, so let's see some other questions here. Um, does do imagers like this tend to work in uh, estuaries and places places that have high organics, or are they really limited to like open ocean settings? Well, you know, the Gulf of Mexico study was on the shelf of the Gulf of Mexico, and so you know, it, it works pretty well in what I would consider kind of turbid waters. Um, the pro the the thing the main hurdle we run into is actually not organics, but it is the what we call optical turbulence, which is also known as the Schlieren effect, which um, if anyone probably doesn't know what that is, but you've seen it a thousand times, whenever you see like a really hot piece of pavement and you see like the air kind of shimmering um, or a, a, an engine on a jet, you know, the, the engine gets really hot and the air coming out of it kind of distorts. We have that effect when we go through really strong salinity changes and so temperature or salinity, if it changes really rapidly, it actually kind of makes the water really distorted. And you might have noticed that in some of the um, images I showed that the background looked kind of like, you know, messy. Mm -hmm. And it can get really extreme when you go like into a river plume where the, you're going from a salinity of like, you know, 30-ish, which is, you know, coastal water to like a, almost fresh water. In that interface, it gets like really, really distorted and you can't see anything except oh, yeah. for like maybe a huge jellyfish. Yeah. And especially with the, such a high resolution camera, you notice those things, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's actually a, a area I would like to, because there's not a lot known about where that phenomenon takes place and kind of like what causes it. And so I've actually talked to people in the Navy who are interested in that 
looking at that uh, with the imaging systems. So it's kind of an unexplored area of the imaging world. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, okay, we had a question. Um, so what, what are some of like the most exciting critters you've seen in Georgia or in the Gulf? In other things Georgia that like you sort of, you hope you look forward to seeing at some point that you haven't seen yet? Well, um, we've seen a lot of cool stuff. I'm trying to think of like, I mean, I guess, I mean, I, I showed the billfish early on. I've never actually seen a billfish in one of our images, um, which would be pretty cool because they're very distinct and easy to identify. Uh, one of the problems with images is that sometimes you see something really neat and you can narrow it down kind of what you think it is, but you can't get like an exact identification. So that's one advantage of net systems is that you can actually put the thing under a microscope and count all the fin rays and figure out exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. And even if you can't do that, you can get a DNA sample and send it off to someone who can identify it for you. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, it, it, I mean, there's just a lot of the more, the most exciting things are really kind of the patches of organisms that you see. So like, as you see the live feed, you'll eventually, you know, it's kind of boring for a while. And all of a sudden it's just like, boom, you're in this patch where there's like a ton of gelatinous things. And you just start asking yourself, like, what is going on here? Like, why are there so many things here? And it's just like fundamental questions that kind of get me more excited like that than, um, you know, it, you just, it's going by so fast that you don't really see individual things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Cool. Uh, actually, that, that transition is great to the next question. So someone asked if uh, you can capture or image uh, can, cannonball jellies. Is that something you've seen before? Yeah, um, you can. They're they're very opaque. So they're like, uh, I don't know if people are familiar with cannonball jellies. They're they're around Georgia and they're, they, they have like a kind of peach-ish color to them. And so that, they're not transparent, like hardly at all. And so they'll actually show up as kind of like a big black blob in our images. But you could definitely do it. I've never actually seen one just because I haven't been in an environment where there have been a lot around when we're deploying the instrument. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you could definitely see them. And they'd be pretty easy to identify, I think. <laughs> so um, it's sort of a, a jelly related question too. Um, and I think the last one, which is um, how do like the, pre um, the predators know that the jellies are not palatable? Is that like something that's innate to them or is that something that they learn by tasting things? I really don't know. Um, we don't really know a whole lot about what causes fish. Like, I, I would, I'm not like a fish psychologist. Like, I don't know what they do <laughs> to find out what tastes good and what doesn't. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's just, it, and it. I don't want to give this impression either that like nothing eats jellies. They're just like a lower percentage of fish will target them. And so there's a few fish species that actually eat almost all gelatinous things. Um, and so that's kind of an interesting question in and of itself. But yeah, I don't really know what, um, what experiences they go through to decide or determine that jellies are not palatable. They're, I mean, I assume that in very desperate situations, like animals will eat things that maybe they're not targeting. But, you know, in choice experiments, like the one, the graph I showed, you know, they're being offered two choices and they're clearly going with the non-gelatinous thing almost mm. always. And so it, it, I think it really, like many things, kind of depends on the what, what's happening in the environment at a given time, whether or not something will eat a gelatinous organism. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Also, it sounds like a new job for ichthyotherapy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> ichthyotherapy, right. Great. Um, yeah, that's all the questions I have here. So thanks a lot, Adam. Sure. Great, thank you very much. Good night, everyone.